something that I learned as a young poet is that there's no such thing as an aspiring writer. If you write, you're doing the work, you're showing up. And so in all technical terms, you've made it. So every single time that I have the fortune of being able to pick up a pen and write, I know that I've arrived exactly at the spot I need to be. Hi, I'm Amanda Gorman, and I'm on set for my cover shoot with Harper's Bazaar. It means a lot to me to be one of the icons for this issue. I remember three or four years ago being at a dinner party with now editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar, Samira Nasser. And I just think back to that moment because I would have never assumed that in the blink of an eye after that, I would have the opportunity of seeing her again, interacting with her again as an icon of the Harper's Bazaar issue. At the time when we were meeting, no one in that room really knew who I was. And so feeling in the trajectory of looking up and coming to terms with the fact that my art means so much to so many people, that's the absolute deepest honor that any writer could have. And it's just a real full circle for me to be here in this moment. The word icon to me means someone who represents something that is larger than themselves. One icon from the past that I would have loved to have had the privilege of meeting would be Maya Angelou, who was an incredible poet. She also was an inaugural poet as well. And I just would have loved to have a conversation with her about what that meant to her life. I feel the most iconic when I feel the most like myself. I will say some instances that really take me back are when I see murals or drawings or artwork of my face or my poetry. It shows me how many people can resonate with a single verse, with a single word, and reminds me that it's not just about the person that's writing the poems, but what the poems are saying that makes that art form so iconic. Poetry has always been integral to my life, although I didn't always know that's what it was called. I remember being five or six years old and writing poems, but not knowing that there was actually a name and a profession for that. I just thought I was finding a way to express myself on the page. And as I continued to grow up, I learned this thing that is a calling can actually be a career for me in my life. I'm not sure if there was a time that I realized I had talent so much as there was a time I realized I had a desire to have talent. And that was when I was in third grade and I was reading Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. And I remember seeing his talent in that piece of art and knowing instantaneously I wanted to work in craft and labor so one day I too could harness the craft and the gift of writing. I don't think I've reached my peak yet, but I think I have reached certain mountaintops by which I can look out at my life and see where I wanna move forward. And I think post-inauguration was definitely one of those moments and locations where I felt like for the first time, I had a real clear bird's eye view of the power that my poetry could have on people and how that power could be used for social change. My process of writing is messy and it can look all over the place, but what it typically consists of is me sitting down and doing as much research as I can. I like looking at archives, newspapers, interviews, trying to get as much kind of gritty informational material. Then from that, I create a word cloud of what is all this information, history, data telling me? And from that like vomit of terminology, I then try to create something that has reason, logic, and movement, and then that will become a poem. There are so many people who inspire me. I believe that I'm not writing alone, but out of a deep, long, heritage of African American writers who have used both the written and spoken word tradition to advocate for social transformation. So I look up to icons like James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, just kind of all of the great epic writers of their time. 
I believe poetry is so important because it's the language of the people. So often when we're speaking to issues that feel larger than life, larger than any one nation or planet even, we do it in the form of heightened language. Two of kind of the core examples I have of that would be the poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty. That is to say, when we reflect on who we want to be as a country, often we feel prose can work, but it's not enough. We need access to another form of language that can bring us together. Another example I bring up a lot in the classroom when I'm teaching would be Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which is not only a singular work of prose, but it's also a historic text of poetry, the way that he uses rhythm, sometimes rhyme, figurative language. It all shows that when you want people to move, to act, to believe, to trust, Poetry really is the language that can get us there. One of the literary works that has had the most impact on me in my life would be The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. And I had never before in class really been assigned a piece of work that had been written by a black feminist. Never had I read a work in class that had characters who looked like me and sounded like me, but also had these rich dimensions of humanity. And from then on, that was the first moment in my life that I ever wrote a short story that was about a black girl, that I ever considered writing poems that were about African-Americans. It challenged me to reimagine what would be possible through language. When I'm feeling discouraged, I look for hope both within and outside of myself. I'm a strong believer that hope isn't an object. It's not something you can buy. It's not property. It's a practice. It's a craft. It's something that you have to do again and again and build up the kind of muscle memory for it. And then I kind of look outrospectively and think, who are the helpers, the lovers, the healers at work that I can look to who I feel, even if I don't know them, I might have never even met them, give me some spark of a belief in humanity. And I can say more often than not, a lot of times I see that type of energy in other young people and other Gen Z members and especially in other artists and creatives. One of the best pieces of advice I have ever gotten would be from Oprah Winfrey, who told me, be aware of other people's agendas and never let them swallow your own. It was a great reminder to always stay true to what I know of myself and who I know myself to be. Whenever people ask me what my advice to the younger generation is, I have to stop and take stock because I think I should actually be listening to the voices and the advice that the next generation has. I think never before have we had a generation who was so sure of not just the urgency, but the emergency of the moment. When my mom was growing up, she was told by teachers, mentors to change the world. When I was growing up, I was told to save the world because that's the type of time and moment we're in. And so if I were to give any piece of advice to the younger generation, it's trust your gut, trust your instincts, trust what you know, and be continuously aware that you are quite literally the force of the future.